Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm not quite sure exactly when this thing goes live here. Here we go. Good morning. Um, good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, not a real happy day today. I'm sorry. Um, I'm probably not going to be as bubbly as I am normal. Um, still very positive and full of hope, though. Uh, our community has been stuck or struck with a, a great tragedy yesterday. Um, a, a freshman from Langdon High School took his life. I contemplated um, on having coffee with Christ today um, because I spent the day yesterday with with the kids, most of the day yesterday with the kids and and just hanging out with them and letting them know that I was there um, and didn't get home until, you know, later last night and hadn't started anything for today yet. and. And I just, I visited with some people and I just said, I think I'm going to have to cancel Coffee with Christ tomorrow because I, I just don't have anything ready. Um, I'm not in the mood. I don't want to let anybody down. But then the more I thought about it, I needed this today. I needed to be with all of you guys. And I need your prayers. And our community needs your prayers. And these sweet, precious kids need your prayers. And so um, we're, we're going to carry on here. I did not um, originally or authentically prepare a message for today. Um, we are going to visit on some suggestions to help um, teens get through this time in a healthy way. And so... Um, I am going to start out with our readings um, because, you know, the Holy Spirit works in wonderful ways, and this is what he's, he's giving us today. We can walk without fear, full of hope and courage and strength, waiting for the endless good which God is always giving as fast as he can get us to take it in. Um, for tomorrow, <clears throat> Psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 30, I could never, I think it's 34, verses 4 and 5. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look at him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And then for Sunday, Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Um, I don't have any acts of kindness today, but I can add that there is a lot of support and acts of kindness going on right now in our communities. I know yesterday the kids um, got together with their groups of friends at different houses where parents invited them in to uh, be there for them, cook for them, of course, and just a place for them all to get together to share memories um, of Braden. And um, I know that the school did an amazing job at this announcement Prayer was brought into the school, praise the Lord. Um, the staff were all amazing, and this is all firsthand from the kids. And so there's a lot of acts of kindness going on right now. Um, our community is at work, and we, we know what we need to do to support these kids and the family of Braden um, and, 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 and the families of all the kids. And so we're going to start out today um, in prayer requests, though, because we need to keep doing that. Obviously, we're going to keep the family and friends of uh, Braden Schwartz in our prayers um, today, tomorrow, and probably for a long time to come. 
a prayer from Margot Margo Butcher. Um, she was a, a gal that I was her second mom back in the day as she was hospitalized and then they're trying to figure out what's going on. A press uh, prayer goes out for Bryce Borgen. Um, he was in a dirt bike accident and he broke his femur in three places. And he's probably having surgery as we speak now. Um, Carol, a friend and listener, and part of the family of Coffee with Christ is his mom. And prayers um, go out to um, Doug and Wanda Loff, as Doug's sister is um, more than likely on her final days of, of hospice. And there we include Tammy and Bruce Berg as well, and all of the family and, and friends there. And so um, I do have a couple readings, though, that um, are kind of kid-related. Um, the 10 lessons I want to instill in my kids, if you're thankful, show it. If you love someone, tell them. If you're wrong, fess up. If you're confused, ask questions. If you learn something, teach others. If you're stuck, ask for help. If you made a mistake, apologize. If you trip, get back up. If someone needs help, help them. If you see wrong, take a stance. We all need to know today that we are someone God loves. We're not our weaknesses. We're not our sins. We're not even our strengths. We're someone God loves, enjoys, and redeems. In Christ Jesus, you're brand new through and through. You don't have to look back and regret or look down in shame. You can look up and honor the name of Jesus who lived, died, and rose again so you could live powerfully, abundantly, and eternally. Refuse to let your setbacks or mess-ups define you because they don't. They can't. They won't. Walk intimately with God. Revere his name. Do what he says. Trust him to be the miracle-working God he claims to be. Be bold, be brave, and be happy in Jesus. He's thrilled to claim you as his own. 1 John 4, verses 9 through 11. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the word that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, um, this reading I'm going to read you, I thought was pertinent um, because there's so many kids out there like this. And when one person reaches out to them, it can change their whole lives. An old man meets a young man who asks, do you remember me? And the old man says, no. Then the young man tells him he was his student. And the teacher asks, what do you do? What do you do in life? The young man answers, well, I became a teacher. Ah, how good, like me, tells, says the old man. Well, yes, in fact, I became a teacher because you inspired me to be like you. The old man, curious, asks the young man at what time he decided to become a teacher. And the young man tells him the following story. One day a friend of mine, also a student, came in with a nice new watch and I decided I wanted it. I stole it. I took it out of his pocket. Shortly after my friend noticed that his watch was missing and immediately complained to the teacher, who was you. Then you address the class saying, this student's watch, watch was stolen during class today. Whoever stole it, please return it. I didn't give it back because I didn't want to. You close the door 
and told us all to stand up and form a circle. You were going to search our pockets one by one until the watch was found. However, you told us to close our eyes because you would only look for his watch if we all had our eyes closed. We did as instructed. You went from pocket to pocket, and when you went through my pocket, you found the watch and took it. You kept searching everyone's pockets, and when you were done, you said, open your eyes, we have the watch. You didn't tell on me, and you never mentioned the episode. You never said who stole the watch either. That day you saved my dignity forever. It was the most shameful day of my life. But this is also the, the day I decided not to become a thief, a bad person. You never said anything, nor did you even scold me or take me aside to give me a moral lesson. I received your message clearly. Thanks to you, I understood what a real educator needs to be and needs to do. Do you remember this episode, Professor? The old professor answered, yes. I remember the situation with the stolen watch, which I was looking for in everyone's pocket. I didn't remember you because I also closed my eyes while looking. Amen. So let's start out and get rolling here and all join in prayer. Good morning, Peggy, Sue, Dean, Pat and the gang, um, Bonnie, um, everybody else here. Dear God of all mercy, from whose love nothing can separate us, we pray this day for all persons dealing with mental illness and those who love and care for them. Especially this day, we pray for all whose lives have been touched by suicide, for those who have died by suicide and those who have attempted it. We pray for those who, because of mental health challenges such as depression, PTSD, or bipolar disorder, live with thoughts of suicide. We pray for those who live in despair and without hope because of poverty or discrimination. We pray for families and friends, colleagues and coworkers, who have been touched by the suicide of a loved one. We pray for counselors and therapists, psychologists and psychiatrists, for pastors, rabbis, priests, and school staff, and for all who seek to help. And we pray too that you might give us the courage and wisdom to be there for others in distress, to offer your love and our care, to help break the silence, and change the conversation about suicide, to be your listening ear, your hands, and your heart for others. We pray this all in your wonderful name. Amen. So today we're going to go over um, just something that I found that I needed that I hope will help you guys as well. Um, in dealing with such tragedy, tragedies as what our communities are going through right now. Um, and it, it's, it was an article on um, explaining suicide to children and young people. So we know that breaking any kind of bad news to children and teens is difficult, but something as painful as suicide makes it even harder. The following ideas and suggestions relate specifically to suicide. We hope our kids never have to experience tragic events, but it's happened in our community. And since this tragedy has occurred, we want to ensure that they'll come through the experience in a healthier way than if we don't talk about it. It's also very important that they're given the truth and included in family and friends grief process. Even including them in the funeral and or the memorial service of a close family member can be healthy for them. Adults often want to shield and protect young people from hearing a difficult truth, but lying to protect them by avoidance or half truth most often has damaging consequences. 
Children and teens will learn the truth from someone else one day and possibly in a warped or unhelpful version. And then the trust in you from them as a close adult can be broken along with your future credibility. Worse, they may feel that that they have now, uh, they now need to honor the lie. They need to honor the lie themselves, bottling up any questions, thoughts, or feelings they have about suicide, therefore preventing them from dealing with its reality in a healthy way. Unacknowledged and unresolved grief often has a long-term negative effects on a person's life, outlooks, and relationships. Here's a quote um, that I found from someone that experienced this. When I didn't get answers to my questions, I came up with my own, which were wrong and also very scary. And I got told things by other kids too, which were half truths. I ended up a mess inside for a long time, afraid of lots of things and not able to trust the adults. I wasn't told the straight truth for many years. Telling me properly at the time would have saved me years of confusion and fear. Now the age and stage of a child or teen, their personality and how close they've been to the person who has died are the kinds of key considerations to take into account when you speak with them. So key things to keep in mind. Tell all your children, even the younger ones, if this is a family matter. Keep it short and simple. Don't over explain. Keep it truthful and consistent. It might be very hard to say and talk about, but say it. Give correct information in a loving, direct, and compassionate way. Use common sense. Avoid unnecessary details. Use words and phrases they know and understand. Don't use terms like asleep, passed on, passed over, and gone on a journey to describe death. Children can take such words literally and get confused about what's actually happened. Be aware of the shock factor. Repeat key information later and check on understanding. Realize early reactions, though often difficult to witness, allow a child or teen to begin to process what's happened. They may range from acute distress to complete numbness, withdrawal, or even seeming disinterest. Be understanding. Many children and teens in fact experience delayed reactions that can often be triggered by the simplest things. Try not to overreact to their reactions. Now, I know last night when I was with the girls, um, there was a lot of crying, but it almost seemed like they were numb, in shock. I don't know if a few of them really it really hadn't set in yet to them. And that's what this kind of talks about. And so in our community, we really need to keep our eyes and ears open to these kids for many, many, many days to come. Encourage them to talk about it and ask questions whenever they need to. And if they do, pay attention well. That's one thing that, um, I did yesterday. I didn't go in and preach to them. I just simply was in their presence, let them know that I'm there for any one of them if they ever need to talk. And I asked if they would like to pray. And every single one of them were super excited about praying together. Expect them to process what's happened over a long period of time. As they grow and mature, they are likely to understand what's happened in new ways. 
They may want to ask questions days, weeks, and even years later. And lastly, reassure them, reassure them, reassure them. Here's another quote from a teen. When I look back at my childhood, it wasn't so much what was said to me that I remember. It's how I was made to feel during that time of such sadness. Now some su suggested answers to children and teens when they ask, what is suicide? And I absolutely love these. I never in my life thought of explaining it this way. Suicide is when a person is so very ill and so deeply sad that they choose to make their body stop working. They had a very serious sickness in their brain that made them very confused and sad so that they didn't want to live anymore. People die in a lot of ways. They might get sick or have a bad accident or they might die because they're old and their body stops working. Suicide means that someone got so sick that they made their own body stop working on purpose. Brains get sick. Just like other important parts of our body do, like our hearts or lungs or liver, their brain got very sick with an illness called depression. This illness got so bad, it muddled up the way they thought and felt and caused them to do something that would make their body die. I want you to know that though, most people with depression do get better with the proper help. When someone gets sick with an illness called depression, it can cause their brains to get so mixed up and confused that they feel very bad inside. They can't even think clearly. Some people get so sick that they can't figure out how to stop the terrible pain that's going on inside of them. They can get so ill that they don't even realize that they can get help to feel better again. To make their pain stop, they make themselves die on purpose. When someone dies by suicide, they choose to end their life because in their mind, living is just too hard for them. They don't know how to get help or don't choose to get help. It isn't a wise choice because they can get help, so they don't have to keep on feeling such hurt and pain all the time. The only person who really knew why this happened to so-and-so is them. There are lots of things we don't know, but we do know that so-and-so loved us and we loved so-and-so. They will always be important in our lives and we can always remember lots of good times we had together. So-and-so had something like a heart attack, except it was a brain attack. Their brain got really sick and, it, and, was, and they weren't able to think properly. They made their body stop working because they got so overwhelmed by the pain in their brain. Now, just like adults, young people bereaved by suicide are likely to feel a range of the following thoughts, feelings, and reactions. Let them know these are normal and okay. Let them find ways to express them, but be ready to allow them to keep them inside for a while too, if that's helpful to them. Everyone is different in how they respond to loss, whatever their age. Never tell them how to feel or think or discourage them from expressing difficult emotions. These are a natural part of the grief process, though they can be hard to see and hear. After being bereaved by suicide, children and teens can feel and think a lot of different things. They can feel that it's their fault, something they did or didn't do or say. They can feel guilty because they did something mean to this person or thought something about them or even wish something about them. They can feel rejected and abandoned. They can feel afraid. Will they or others die too? Who will take care of them now? 
They can experience denial. They can refuse to believe that it has happened. They can feel numb, unable to take it in or feel anything. They can feel sad with intense and emotional pain. They can feel embarrassed, ashamed, awkward. They can feel confused. They can feel angry, mad at the person and at others they may want to blame. God or everyone. They can feel very alone. They can feel overwhelmed, wanting it all just to go away, just to stop. Some can feel relieved if attempts or threats have already been experienced. So what's most important for them to know? They need to know that they are loved and will be taken care of and supported. They need to know that they are safe. They need to know that it's not their fault in any way at all. Nothing they did or didn't do or, or didn't say or do caused this. And this message needs to repeat it, be repeated over and over and over again. They need to know it's okay to talk about the person with us and to ask questions. They need to know that they won't always feel the way that they do right now. Things will get better and a bit less painful, just a little bit every day. We need to encourage them with a sense of hope. They need to know that they're feeling grief and sadness because they loved and cared about so-and-so. Everyone's different, so we all grieve in different ways. There are no rules or right or wrong ways to feel or think after someone dies. They can do it their way. They need to know that so-and-so wasn't a bad person. So-and-so was a very ill person who wasn't able to make a good choice. They need to know that not everyone who feels very sad or gets ill with depression will die by suicide. There are doctors and others who help and mostly people get well again and are helped to manage their strong feelings and thoughts. Suicide is not common. And what else is important? It's important to keep up normal routines as much as possible. This helps a sense of security. It's important to be aware um, that many children and teens bereaved by suicide are very sensitive to being left and may be more clingy, more fearful, more tearful, less confident. Be patient with anxiety around separation and plan for good care with trusted adults. Avoid speaking negatively of the person who has died, however angry you may be feeling yourself. Younger children may not understand that death is permanent and so may think they can visit the person who's died. Teach them about death. It is helpful to let them know that some people may want to say some mean things to them about what's happened. Help them deal with these comments by planning to just ignore them and to tell an adult right away or by having something ready to say like, she was, or they were really ill and very sad. I don't want you to talk meanly about them. It's not okay. Let them know they always get to decide how much information to share with others. It might help, again, to have something to say, like um, so-and-so got really sick and died suddenly. Or just straight out, so-and-so died by suicide. It's really been sad. It's a personal choice. Let them know they don't have to share any more details and can stop conversations at any minute if they get uncomfortable. Simply by saying, thank you, but I don't want to talk about this anymore. 
role model that it's okay to talk often with close friends and family about the person who died. Don't avoid saying their name. Mention them amongst friends and family. This helps to be able to enjoy a continuing link with them without any sense of shame or stigma. Show them lots of affection. Tell them how much you love them. Praise and encourage them. And tell them how proud you are on the way they're handling things. Stay connected with them. Check in with them and how they're doing. This morning, I texted all my kids and just, I didn't say, how are you doing? I said, just checking in with you with a hug and a kiss. Don't make it intense. Perhaps the odd snatch of conversation as you walk or drive or do an activity together is just enough. Keep the door open for them. And remember, suicide happens when a person's intense emotional and mental pain becomes far greater than their ability to cope with it. Instead of placing value judgments on suicide, talking with children and teens about good ways to get help if we get overwhelmed by things is a constructive and potentially life-saving approach to take. It gives them empowering tools at a time when they feel powerless about so much else that's going on. If the child or teen becomes very sad and depressed, and does not improve over many weeks, get them professional help. See um, a mental health, a general practitioner, professional, or counselor. In extreme cases, don't hesitate to call your hospital's ER department or emergency services for support and assistance. I found this very helpful for me in the days ahead here as I'll probably be talking with the kids. I hope you did as well. But a couple of other things that came to mind here. Just last Wednesday on church school, we visited Good Friday in our message. We read the story of Good Friday. And when Jesus was nailed to the cross hanging there, somebody yelled to him, you are the son of God. Save yourself. But Jesus didn't save himself. He had the capability. God had the capability. But he chose not to save himself. He chose to save us by dying on the cross. Suffering for us. Another thing that came to mind and we talked about this quite a long time ago, but the devil is out there. You know, these some of the kids, some of us are going to say, why, why does God let this stuff happen? God doesn't let this stuff happen. The devil's still out there, my friends. And you know what? He also gave us free will. He gave us free will to make choices. And oftentimes, if we don't reach out to him, he doesn't intercede in some of the bad choices that we make. If we didn't have free will, we wouldn't need God. And that devil is out there. The apple was picked. And the devil is strong and trying to work in each and every one of our lives each and every day. Some of us, though, however, with mental illness are not strong enough to identify that, are not strong enough to identify um, that we, we need to turn to the Lord, you know, get help. Turn to the Lord for help. Turn to professionals for help. Um, yesterday, I asked the girls one question. He said, are any of you mad at God right now? I was so proud of their answer. They said, no, we aren't, we aren't mad at God, but we're confused. And so their question, I'm sure, was, why did God let this happen? And you know what? We don't often 
truly understand why everything happens. Why do people get cancer? Why do people get in car accidents? Um, why, why, why do bad things happen? We don't often understand, but that's when we put our faith in God's promises. Um, and um, the biggest thing that pops in my head as a reminder to this is that God chose not to save him, or excuse me, Jesus chose not to save himself. He chose to save us. And so even though God is all powerful, almighty, can do anything, um, we must have faith in his choices. We must have faith in his choices. So anyway, um, today I want to thank you like no other day. Thank you for being with me today. Um, please keep me in your prayers. Um, um, please keep Pastor Jody in your prayers. Um, and all other uh, ministers, pastors, um, priests in the area <clears throat> as we deal with this tragedy. Help us um, to be of power through the Holy Spirit um, to this community in mourning and grief right now. And please pray for the community, the kids, the families, um, for strength, understanding, and direction. Let us all join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon all of you and be gracious unto all of you. May the Lord look upon each and every one of you with his favor and give you all his amazing praise. peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is truly a gift from God. That is why they call today the present. Make the most of this beautiful day because this is the day that the Lord has made. And let us all rejoice and be glad in it. My heart, soul, and prayers go out to the Braden Schwartz family. And may he rest in peace. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you on Monday.